Take your Bible, if you would, and turn with me to James chapter 3. You say, wow, we made it back to James. Indeed, we do this morning. Um, in fact, 15 months ago, on April the 3rd, 2016, Sunday, April the 3rd, um, we began our study of this little book in the Bible. The name of it is the book of James. Um, seven months ago, on December, or excuse me, November the 27th, um, just as we came to Thanksgiving, uh, we, we did our last sermon um, from the book of James. That was message 28. And so this morning is message 29 as we return to the book of James. Now, we study the Bible here at Sheridan Hills. And those of you who are new to us this morning, we have a little phrase that we say here. And um, I want to encourage you to listen and then repeat it after me in just a moment. The reason that we study the Bible is because of this. Truth in the mind brings hope to the heart. Can you say that out loud together with me? Truth in the mind brings hope to the heart. You see, God has made us in such a way that we can intellectually know what he wants us to know. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be a quote-unquote intellectual, but being a human being, you're already an intellectual. So you can say that, I'm an intellectual, and you can be kind of proud of that, because God has made us to be able to process knowledge. He's given you a mind. He's given you the most powerful mind on the planet, the most powerful brain on the planet. There's not another creature that even comes close to what he has given to us. And so this morning we see, once again, that when we study his truth, when we study his word, his word can bring hope to our heart. Now, it doesn't do that just through the mere knowledge and the mere intellect that we have. It's coupled with his Holy Spirit, that as he comes and he breathes on his word in us, he opens our minds to the truth, he opens our hearts to the truth, and we find the wisdom of God for the heart of God that he's given us. So this morning we come to James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, and um, I want you to notice with me that we're going to, going to begin this morning with a pretty good review. Um, about a third of this message is going to be review. I want us to do it very quickly for two reasons. Number one, there's some people here that have not been able to be part of our first study, the first 28 messages from this little book. And so you're kind of wondering, what is the book of James? Who was it written to? What does it matter to me? How can it actually apply to me at all? Um, I want you to see the overview real quick. Now, the second group of people is those who have had, been here and heard most of these messages. If you're like me, you need to be reminded of some things. So it doesn't do any good to study the Bible very much without context. The Bible depends upon context. You need to know what comes before a passage, what comes after it, how does it fit, and then you understand the true meaning of it. And so we we want to do that this morning. Notice with me the review that is here. First of all, the title is Two Kinds of Wisdom. We're going to see that, and we're going to ask ourselves some questions about what kind of wisdom we have of the two kinds. But let's look at the review. First of all, the review is this. The, the letter of James is written by, do you remember, the half-brother, the half-brother of Jesus. Now, he's the half-brother of Jesus because he was born, James was born from Mary, the mother of Jesus, but who was Jesus' father? His true father was the Holy Spirit. Jesus was conceived as a virgin, uh, excuse me, Mary conceived Jesus as a virgin through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a very important point concerning the nature of Christ and the fact that he would be the only one who could truly pay for our sins, a sinless child of God. So look at number two with me. This guy, James, the half-brother of Jesus, number two, James was the pastor of the first church in Jerusalem. So we're going back to one of the big guns of the church. James, half-brother of Jesus, pastor of the church in Jerusalem, the early church. Number three, the letter of James is the first letter to Jewish Christians and churches spread around the Mediterranean world. This morning, when we come to the book of James, we're seeing the first letter that went out. And it was sent out about 15 years after the Lord Jesus had died and risen again and then ascended to the Father. 
Number four, Pastor James was already concerned about faulty faith, and then fill this in, from cultural Christianity. You say cultural Christianity had already started to take root? Indeed it had. We know that from the letters of Paul to uh, the Corinthians. We know that from the letters of James to the churches that are spread abroad, abroad um, that there, were, there was already faith that was more interested in relig religiosity than it was truly interested in God. And that's what we come to in number five. Pastor James, this is important, calls out people for being religious but not godly. You see, the book of James very much applies to 2017 because we have the same tendency as the people who were alive and worshiping together as the very earliest of Christians. Human beings gravitate toward being religious instead of being godly. We're good at being religious. There's all kinds of religions, some of them even in the name of Jesus, that do not truly understand the true nature of what God has for us and how he calls us to himself, how he redeems us, and how he calls us to live. So they were, they were interested in being religious, but they weren't necessarily interested in being godly, and God wants us to be like him. So look at number six. Pastor James was very concerned about ingenuous salvation. That is, people who say they are Christian, but they live like the world lives. So they're confessing the name of Christ, but they're not living in the Christian way. That is a very common problem in our day and time as well. And that is here in this room as well, as we need to look and see what God says about how to, to be genuine Christians. Look at number seven. Pastor James is not focusing on theological knowledge, but godly behavior. Some of your New Testament letters have a lot of deep theology in them. The doctrines of, of either uh, soteriology, which is how you are saved, or eschatology, which is the, the coming events that are in the future, or perhaps ecclesiology, which has to do with how the church is to operate. There's all of these different doctrinal letters, but James is not a very deep, thick doctrinal letter so much as it is a letter that is saying, are you living what you say you believe? You see, there's a very, very practical nature to our relationship with God. Again, being very religiously prone, we will often gravitate even sometimes toward more knowledge, more theological knowledge, more of the mechanics of how God saves us, more of the mechanics of how God works, when actually we need to be paying attention to, am I actually obeying God? Am I walking close to him? Am I in communion with God today? Am I in communion with him as I go to work, as I live with my family, as I live out my faith? You see, that's what James is concerned about. Notice here with me that there are 50 imperatives that are given in the book of, this, of James, this short little letter. That means there's 50 commands that are here. And this really has, this is part of the wisdom literature of the New Testament. This is the application of what you know to daily life. And that word wisdom will come up a lot this morning. Look at number eight. Pastor James, James explodes the relationship between faith and works. What do I mean by that? He is very concerned that you say that you have faith. He is also saying, okay, you say you have faith, but do you have the evidence to prove it in your life? Do you have the works that go with that faith? Are you obeying? Are your actions matching your words? Does your walk match your what? Your talk. And so James is very concerned about that. In fact, this whole letter, he's just exploding that issue. He's bringing up that issue, and he's saying, let's really talk about this. And he's going through example after example after example after example that he's saying, 
Do you really live what you say that you believe? This is very important to us. Look at number nine. Pastor James gives several tests. The word there is test. He gives several tests to help you determine if you are a true Christian. Now, what are those tests? Here they are, and they're at the bottom of the page. We've already looked at them. This is basically an outline of the book of James. We're going to move very quickly as we see these. But you see in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, is the test of perseverance in suffering. Uh, suffering is a reality of life. Christians do not suddenly get delivered from all suffering in this life when they believe upon Christ. You still go through suffering. This is part of the way that God brings about his will in our lives. It's part of the way that he grows us. It's part of the way that our faith is tested. And we must come to realize that God works through the suffering of this life. And it brings him glory as we choose to follow him even amidst the suffering. You see, notice the, the sideline that is there. True faith grows when tested. There's also the test of blame and temptation. Now, this comes from James chapter 1 when he says, if, are, if, you, if anyone is tempted by God, don't blame it on God. There's some who would be like Adam and say, Lord, it was the woman you gave me. And it would be like Eve saying, Lord, it was the serpent that showed up. What we see in the Bible is that God calls us to simply stand before God and take responsibility for our sin, recognizing that we are sinners in need of a Savior. There's many who cannot come to that place. They either do refuse to recognize their sin or they come to the place of saying it's someone else's fault. True Christians, James shows us, do not blame God, do not blame others. True Christians say, no, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. Look at the number three. There's the test of the response to God's Word. What does someone do with God's Word? Do they receive it? Do they, do they receive the Word implanted into their soul, which is able to save them, or do they reject the Word? Do they constantly say, oh, no, it can't really mean that, it doesn't really say that, it's really not that bad, Jesus, did he really do that? All, all just constantly coming to the place of rejecting God's Word would show that we do not have true saving faith. Number four is a big one. It's the test of partiality or impartial love. James is saying to the early church, look, if you're Jewish, you can't hate the Gentiles. Look, if you're a Gentile, you can't hate the Jews. Look, if you're rich, you can't despise the poor. If you're poor, you can't despise the rich. If you're powerful, you can't despise the weak. James is saying this, if you're really a Christian, you are not going to show partiality to, because God looks on the inside. Man may struggle with looking on the outside, but God judges impartiality, impartially as he deals with our hearts. You see, under number four, true faith loves and respects everyone. Number five, the test of righteous deeds and works. The question is, do you do what you say is right? Do you seek to live in that way? It doesn't mean that you never, ever fail. It doesn't mean that you never struggle. It doesn't mean that there's not ever a sin in your life. But it does mean this, that you are seeking to walk in the way of faith and truth and that you are doing that. As Uncle Tom Eliff said when he was here preaching in June of last year, he said, is your life on the upward path of honoring God, growing in victory? You know, it's important for us to recognize that you're never standing still with God. Never. You are all the time either moving closer to him or moving further away from him. On every day of your life, you're either moving toward God or you're moving away from Him. Because you see, it's, it's this picture that God has called us into a, a loving relationship, and love seeks to grow in its affection and its devotion 
and its service to those around you. We've explained it like this. What would happen if, if I said to Marcy, Marcy, I'll love you up to this point and no more? How would she feel about that? I can tell you that she, you, you, you would know it, and she wouldn't be happy with that. She wouldn't stand for that. She desires that my love for her would grow with each day, that my devotion to her would grow, that I wouldn't say, I'll let you into my life up to this point, and then that's it. God is the same way. God has called us into a growing relationship with him where our words and our deeds match. Number six is a tough one, the test of the tongue. You say that you honor God, but does your tongue show that you do? You see, true faith has a tongue that's controlled by Christ. And we spent a long time working on that one. In fact, four sermons were devoted to James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. And then we dropped off there. Um, Now we come to number seven, the test of godly wisdom. True faith thinks and acts like God. See, wisdom is the bringing together of knowledge with life. Wisdom is knowledge and truth applied. That's what wisdom is. And so God says it's it's one thing to know things, but it's another thing to apply those things to your life. Wisdom applies what it knows. God calls us to walk in his wisdom. And then the last one will be the test of worldly indulgence in the weeks to come. So we'll be looking at that. You can safely turn your sheet over now. No one will slap your hand for that, I promise. Look at James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. We should be pretty much up to speed at this point. And um, I want you to catch this new message of, of text as we come to James chapter 3 and verse 13. Notice what it says. Who is wise in understanding among you? Part of the idea here is, who claims to be a Christian? Who claims to be a mature Christian? 13. Who is wise in understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of what? Of wisdom. Can you circle the word wisdom? That's what this is all about. Verse 14. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. He's saying don't be loud and proud about your faith if you have jealousy and selfishness. Verse 15, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above. Can you write above the word above heaven? That's what is referenced there, the presence of God. Verse 15 is, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, even demonic. Verse 16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Verse 17, but the wisdom from above, there it is again, the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable. It's gentle, open to reason, full of what? Mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Everybody read verse 18 together. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So here is the picture that James is saying, do you claim to be wise? Do you claim to have understanding in your life? Well, it's going to be shown by how you live. Now, the key observations here, number one, and you can fill this in, is it's a very big deal that there are two kinds of wisdom in the world. That's what these verses are showing us. These six verses are saying there's two different ways to apply what one, what one can know. And these two ways are radically different. Letter A is that there is heavenly or godly wisdom 
Whereas letter B is, there's what kind of wisdom? Earthly or what? Ungodly wisdom. So A is godly wisdom that comes from above, and B is earthly wisdom that doesn't come from above. Well, if we look at letter A, what kind of wisdom is that? Well, right under letter A is, it's the biblical wisdom of the Old Testament believers. That's what he, James is saying here. Heavenly wisdom is the wisdom that the Old Testament was talking about. Wisdom that not is just Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon and Proverbs and Psalms that are there in the wisdom and poetry section of the Old Testament, but it's also the wisdom as, of God as seen through the acts of God, the works of God in the Torah, the law of God, the wisdom of God in this. He is saying that there is a wisdom that comes from above that shows us how to live in this life. And that wisdom that comes from above is actually from, and you've filled it in already, God. But this earthly, ungodly wisdom is very different from that. And under letter B, you can see there that there is an earthly, ungodly wisdom that is a worldly wisdom of pagans. And where does it come from? It says it right there in verse 15. It comes from demons. Everybody look at verse 15 right there in the middle of that text box. It says, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and circle it, demonic. You see, all falsehood comes from Satan. All falsehood comes from the one who is called the father of lies. He's called an angel of light. So that even means he is deceptive. And so what he seeks to do is to gnaw away, he seeks to thwart, he seeks to circumvent the true knowledge of God. And so in doing so, from the very beginning, his first interactions with Adam and Eve are he already begins twisting. He doesn't just come saying his own thing, he comes twisting what God said. And so he comes tempting, he comes deceiving, he comes looking and promising something good while the end is destruction. You see, this is sin. Sin looks good at the moment, but it winds up coming back around to be poison. It takes us away from God's design and all that is good and holy based upon what the Creator has designed and, and put forth that we might experience His joy. Notice here with me that it's worldly wisdom and it comes from demons. Look at the next part here. One of the ways to look at this earthly wisdom, the ungodly wisdom, is it kind of, it's in terms of being streetwise. Have you ever thought about that before? Have you ever heard that phrase, streetwise, before? You know, you know somebody and they're like, well, that dude is streetwise. You know, I, I, Larry, I'm sorry, the folks from New York City, they often will say, yeah, you know, we, we, if you grow up on the streets of Chicago or you grow up on the streets of New York City, you better, you better know what's going on. And Larry and Deirdre have lived, how many of you all have lived in New York City or near to New York City before? So there's several of you that kind of know what I'm talking about. I mean, there's kind of the, the folks that know what's going on and they kind of keep their wallet with them or they keep it. And there's folks that don't know because it's a big city and it's fast moving and there's fast talkers that are there, right? And that can be the case for Jakarta and Manila, and that can be the case for Buenos Aires, and that can be the case for Rio de Janeiro. I mean, there, there's, there's this, this idea of things that are the streetwise sense. Notice this, we would also say it this way. Wise in the what? In the ways of what? Wise in the ways of the world. Now, usually when we're talking about streetwise and we're talking about wise in the ways of the world, we're not talking about godly wisdom, are we? We're talking more so, I mean, just kind of fill in some of these words. We're, we're talking about that which is corrupt, that which knows how to take a bribe. I, I, I have to be honest with you. When we moved to Africa, I, 
I did not realize as I dealt with officials what they were doing sometimes. They were stalling and stalling and stalling, and what are they waiting on? Me to, and I was so oblivious and so naive, I didn't really, I mean, I just sat there and talked to them for hours and hours and hours, and, and I, quite honestly, I waited them out. And after a while, I started realizing that's kind of what was going on, so I would just, you know, I'd bring a nice big Toblerone chocolate bar, and I'd give, and then, you know, you, you give them a nice chocolate, but is that a bribe? Well, I don't know, it was kind of a gift, but it, meant, it wasn't full-on hard, cold cash given by Southern Baptists that I was going to uh, bribe officials with. IMB has a policy of no bribes. We don't pay bribes. And so there's this streetwise, there's this corruption that can often come. It can be seductive, and seductive as in maybe sexual, maybe not sexual. Maybe there's, there's other ways to be seduced into that which is wrong. How about the word conniving? Conniving when there's, when there's a, a scheming in order to take advantage, where there's a scheming in order to bring dissent. And there's some people that are very, very good at ske scheming and conniving. Well, if I write the email this way and send it at this time, just it, in this way, it'll, it'll land in his situation so he will be moved toward this, or she will be moved to think that. You see, this is conniving. This is scheming. A couple of other words here. Sometimes deceiving. Or even manipulative. Saying something so that someone will feel a certain way and have to do a certain thing. Now, some of you have been raised in homes where that is very much what goes on, even in the interfamily relationships. And I just want to say to you, that's part of the fall. That's sinful. It's not right. God calls us to be humble and open and straightforward, not have double meanings in all that we say and all that we do. Godly wisdom, wisdom from above, is not corrupt and seductive and conniving and deceiving and manipulative. That's the way the world thinks. And James, Pastor James is saying that for your own relationships within your family are called to be that, your own relationships in your church are called to be that way, your own relationships within your, your work community are called as a Christian to be upon truth and grace and love. And so are you beginning to see the difference between heavenly, godly wisdom and earthly, ungodly wisdom? What is ultimately the, the source of earthly, ungodly wisdom? Satan. I mean, that's what we see. But I, I want you to see 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12. We see this in another book of the Bible from another author. So this isn't James. This is Paul writing. I want you to see what Paul says, and this is on your outline right there in the middle. For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience. What he's, he's saying is, is that we, we have a clear conscience as we dealt with you Corinthians. He's saying, our, our boast is this, the testimony of our confidence, that we have behaved in the world with simplicity and godly what? Those are two wonderful things. Simplicity and godly sincerity. That, those are godly ideas. You know, you, you know there's, there's some things that are real complex. Now, not all complexity is wrong. I mean, God has made some very complex things. But when it comes to relationships and interactions, if all of the emotion and all of the conniving that is there becomes very complex, then it begins to show that this is bringing about not order but disorder. Paul is saying, we didn't come to you like that. We came with simplicity. We came with godly sincerity. And then underline it there in your outline, not by earthly wisdom, but by what? But by the grace of God, and supremely so toward you. What is he saying? He's saying, we really acted in a godly way toward you Corinthians. 
Now, look at what I've done on the screen that's in front of you. I've, I've highlighted this where the blue words are showing you this idea that where it says, we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity. The red words, what is that? Not by earthly wisdom, but blue words again, but by the grace of God. You see, God is calling us to live simply and sincerely with our brothers and our sisters around us. And true Christians, James is telling us, are going to do that. You see, the source of these wisdoms is critically important and indicates much. Either you and I are, are dominated and operated by God's wisdom, or we are dominated and operated by the world's wisdom or by even Satan's wisdom. So the first one is, is that there's a very big deal between two kinds of wisdom, godly wisdom or un or ungodly wisdom, earthly wisdom. Number two, we see in this passage this big idea. Number two, your behavior will reveal which wisdom you have. That is the bottom line. What you do will show which wisdom you have and how you really are. And this is what James wants the early church to see. He's saying, don't claim Christ and then live in a way that's, that's not accurate to what Jesus has said. When you obey, when you walk in the way of Christ, you are showing by your behavior that you have the true wisdom of God. But when you walk like the world, when you act like the world, when you talk like the world, when your relationships are complicated like the world, it begins to show that you're not operating under the simplicity and sincerity of God's design. So notice this. There's godly wisdom on the left, and there's worldly wisdom on the right. Go ahead and fill those in. And I've just divided it up. This is another way to read the passage. You can just read the passage uh, at the top of the page where you can see it here. Look at the godly wisdom. You see it's good conduct. That's right out there to the side, behavior. That's the idea. It's your actions, good conduct. In meekness, I have to be careful to say meekness does not mean what? Thank you. Meekness does not mean weakness. Meekness is this idea of, of strength under control. It's similar to discipline mixed with humility. And so it's, it's, it doesn't mean that you're weak. It just means that you don't have a high opinion of your opinion. You have a proper opinion of your opinion. And you have a proper opinion of other people's opinion. It's a, it's a meekness that is godly. Notice the next part. It's pure and true. We see that, that, that is in this passage, that there's a purity here that is, that is beautiful. It's peaceable. You see, it's not, it's not bringing about division and strife. Notice the next word that is there. It's gentle. And below that, it's reasonable. Where do we, where do we see all of these? I, I, I want you to see it. Look at verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first, what is that word? Pure. And it's peaceable. It's gentle. It's open to reason. There's where that reasonableness comes in. It's open to reason. Do, do I need to say that we live in a day when, when we don't see very much reason? And what I mean by that is that we, we live in a time when there's, we have lots of information but very little reasoning actually going on. We have many people who know a lot, but they don't know how to apply what they know. In fact, we can have all of these sets of, of criteria, all of these sets of information, and not know how to properly deduct from that, that knowledge and from all of those facts the reality that is, in before, that is before us. Our society is becoming increasingly illogical, Part of that is because of the takeover of emotions. 
emotion, how some, we, we, we rarely hear people say, well, well, I think this, I think this, or my position is this, and, and lay out reasons. Now we often hear what? I feel. You think about it. Well, I feel that, and then we talk about it. You say, isn't it just another way to describe your thinking? Well, not necessarily. When emotions take over logical, rational thought, we are moving more toward the impulses of the flesh and the impulses of the heart, and that is a very dangerous thing to do. The culture all around us, not just in America, but the world culture is moving away from rational thought based upon basic truth that God has laid out either in nature or specifically in His Word. And so we as Christians need to say, wait a minute, we're called to to think clearly. God has given us a brain and He's given us truth that we can that we can process the truth that he has given us and we can understand and we can know and we can deduct from that what is right and that which is wrong. And so look at verse 17 again. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, a harvest and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So we need to just see that this is the picture of where God's wisdom comes from and where it goes. But notice the other side there. Worldly wisdom is bitter with jealousy. It has selfish ambition. It boasts, and it's filled with falsehood. It's not pure and true. There's deception involved. And what does it result in? Look at the middle of verse 16. Look at verse 16 at the top of the page. Look what it says. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be what? Disorder in every vile practice. And so the worldly wisdom doesn't end well. The worldly wisdom doesn't actually bring people together because in the only way you get people, human beings together, is for there to be grace and gentleness and forgiveness. Why? Because we're sinful people. But when we, when we exalt the wisdom of the world, there's disorder, there's every vile practice. And notice that word vile, it's very interesting and it's very descriptive. It means putrid or rotten or rancid. I want you to think about the results of the worldly wisdom. We're seeing physical descriptors that are here. Just this week, I went into the cupboard at our house. Are you ready? I had run out of my grape jam, and so I went for another can of jam. Now, we have a lot of visitors in our house very often, and sometimes things get put away where they need to be, and sometimes they don't. Somebody had opened a can of jam a few months ago, and it didn't go back in the refrigerator. Where did it go? Back into the cupboard as if it was an unopened can of jam. Now, I'm sure that that was not my lovely wife or my daughter who was present this morning, and I'm certain it wasn't me. But anyways, somehow, it got back into the cupboard. I opened it up, put it out there on the toast, and took a nice big bite. I can still feel the tingling and the zinging in in my jaw. I ran to the sink, and what did I do? It was, it was rancid. You have events in your life that you can look back to something that was truly disgusting, either in your house or in your business or somewhere. And I mean, you, you come up on an animal or you come up on meat or chicken or something else, and there's little worms all over it. There are maggots that are running through it. 
and the smell is pungent. It is disgusting. And all of the alarms that God has given you visually and with your olfactory senses, all of that says this is dangerous. This is not good. This is not healthy. And that's one of the ways that you survive as a human is that you don't eat things. You, you have alarms that God has given you that warn you that this is not good for you. This is poisonous. Now, when we look at every vile practice, we, there's some that are sensitized to that, and they are saved by the fact that that is obviously not good. And what James is saying to us is, is that the way of a true Christian looks upon the ways of the world that are they're good and holy and meek and pure and right, and they gravitate toward that. A true Christian doesn't run to that which is putrid. A true Christian is not going to be able to continue in that which is... now. If you're not a Christian, if the Holy Spirit is not living within you, if his truth has not converted your heart and changed your heart, then you're going to be able to go along with all of the strife and, in fact, maybe even thrive in it. And you're going to be able to go along with all of the deception, and you may even be good at it. And there may be disorder, and that may be kind of your your realm. You've learned to manipulate it and take care of it. You've learned to deal with it. And then there may even be every vile practice, and this may have to do with either business deals, or this may have to do with hurting the poor or ignoring the poor. This may have to do with relationships where, where you're really good at stirring up trouble, and you're fine with that. Maybe it's real subtle and real quiet, but you know how to do it, and you, you, you're just fine with that. Or maybe it has to do with, in part, what is reference here is is sexuality that there's that there's aspects of this that are not God's way and and you're just good with that oh friends let us see what James is saying he's saying come to the Savior come remember the truth stay in the truth and look at your life and you can know if you gravitate toward the ways of the world or you gravitate toward the ways of God Oh, the beauty of this. Now, the last point, I I just have to tell you that this week, as I was studying this, this last thing just got me. Look, first of all, at the top of the page. Let's reread verse 17 and 18. This sets it up. I want you to see how this godly wisdom, where it really comes from. Look at verse 17, what it looks like and where it comes. Look at verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first, what? Pure. Wow. The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable and gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let me just say that verse 17 and 18 is all pointing to Christ. It's all pointing to the Messiah. It's all pointing to the true essence of the way of God and the person of God. I started to look at this and just was so blessed that you see, true wisdom, pure wisdom, is, the, is Christ personified. What does personified mean? It means made in person. So fill that in. Number three is that Christ is the personification of godly wisdom. Do you want to know what godly wisdom looks like? Look to Jesus. Look at what Jesus says. Look at what he does. Look at... Look at who he is. You see, he's from above. He comes in purity. He comes bringing peace. He's called the Prince of Peace. Oh, I'm so blessed by this. Fill these in. He's from above. Jesus, the advent of Christ, coming into the world. He is pure. He, He wasn't born of Joseph. He was born of the Holy Spirit. 
in Mary. You see, he's pure. He's not tainted by sin. He is gentle. He comes, and for 30 years he lives with us. And he gently begins to tell us the truth. In Matthew chapter 11, 29, we see that he is gentle in his spirit. He's gentle in his way. We see in Luke chapter 2 that when he was still a boy, that he got separated from his mother and father. He was about 12 years old, and he's back. They said, oh my goodness, we're heading back up to Galilee. Do you have Jesus? No. Where's Jesus? And some of you remember that story from Luke chapter 2. Joseph and Mary, they realize Jesus is not with the, the group of people that is traveling back up after being down in Jerusalem. So they hurry back to Jerusalem, and where do they find Jesus? He's in the temple, and who's he talking to? He's talking to all of the leaders in the temple, and they are amazed at the, the things that he is saying. They are amazed at the questions that he is asking. They are amazed, listen to this, at the reasoning that he is giving. They're, they're astounded by it. You see, Jesus is a, is a reasoning, truthful, logical God, and his wisdom is personified in that. He makes peace. That's what he does. Ephesians chapter 2 says that he comes to make peace between God and man. That he comes, and the gospel comes, and it comes, and it covers our sin. And he washes over us with his grace, bringing peace between heaven in the earth. You see it full of mercy. The Lord Jesus and Titus, we see that he is a merciful God that comes to us in all of our sin. He comes to us in all of our trouble. And for all who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be saved. He comes and he, in his mercy, forgives our sins through his death on the cross. And you know what? He produces perfect results. He has perfect results in his work. And that's what we see here is that these good fruits are perfect. In James chapter 1 and verse 18, we, his followers become his first fruits. He takes us from a place of sin and brokenness and transfers us into the kingdom of his beloved son. He makes us the first fruits of creation, Christ being the first to rise from the dead, and we follow in perfect results. You see, no one goes to the heaven, no one goes to heaven partially made whole. That, that doesn't even work grammatically and logically. He makes us whole, and he, and he completely redeems us. He forgives all all of our sin, and he makes us his trophy of grace so he can prop up who we were, and he props up who he made us to be, and he says, look, this one is a trophy of my grace. This shows off my grace and my mercy. Oh, the beauty of his love. And he is impartial. impartial. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17, we see that the judgment of God is impartial. He knows very well what he is doing. And his love is sincere, completely and totally sincere. There's, there's no faking. There's no shallowness in it. His sincere Love is seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians 13. And what does all of this result in? His peace multiplies out of himself to others. And not only to those others, but then to more others. He multiplies his peace out upon the earth through his people. And James is saying, if you're truly a Christian, you're going to begin to look like Jesus. You're going to reflect the Savior who died for you. 
some of you would be saying, but pastor, you, you went through those other tests on the other side of the page, and then you're going through this test of the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. And there's, there's things in my life that do not pass these tests. I would say one of two things. Either number one, you've maybe been religious, but you've not come to Christ and allowed him to convert your soul to godliness through his death on the cross. Or perhaps you have come to Christ, but you've not lived in victory of Christ in your life, allowing him to vanquish the flesh, allowing him to produce his godly results that he says will happen. And I would say to you this morning, at either point, we say, Lord Jesus, come and give me the heart of faith to believe in you, to trust in you, to depend upon you. If you hear these words this morning and you see your life this morning and you hear his voice saying, come and to cast all of your care upon me, come and cast your sin upon me, I went to the cross for you, this morning receive what he has done for you in Christ. The Bible makes it very clear it is our responsibility to respond. It is our responsibility to repent of our sin, to turn to the Savior who died for us, and to turn to the Savior who died for our sins, and to receive His grace and forgiveness. So, I just want to say, true Christians turn to God. True Christians turn to God and live in His wisdom, not the wisdom of the world. Are you a true Christian? You see, some of the hardest ones are not the ones that are so flagrantly, openly rejecting God and doing their own thing. Some of the hardest ones are the ones that go to church every Sunday. Much like the letter that is aimed at the first century Christians. We need to be very careful to evaluate carefully our hearts. Allow God to speak to us and to either confirm that we indeed are his or to say no. Repentance is needed and necessary and belief is what we're being called to. So here's the question under number three at the bottom. If you, or the first statement is, if you truly have Jesus, your behavior will show it. That's what James is saying. Your behavior will show it. And so the question is, which wisdom do you have? Would you stand with me for prayer?